So next up, we are going to be hearing from Casey Holland. Uh, so Casey Holland has been farming in the middle Rio Grande Valley for 10 seasons, and she's currently running Chispas Farm, a certified organic four-acre urban farm in the heart of Albuquerque. And Casey, I hear that we might get to see a little bit of the farm today. Yes, absolutely. I'm looking forward to taking you all on a bit of a farm tour here. All right, let's get going. It's exciting. All right, so... Yes, thank you for the introduction. Um, this farm here has been in production, growing food since 2001, but I just want to hold space also that it's currently on occupied Tiwa territory and the work that we're doing here as far as sustainable and regenerative agriculture that we're striving for was started long before by the original inhabitants of this land and I am so honored to be able to continue this work and to steward this land in this way. And I think it's really beautiful how far along the farms come. So I think what I'm gonna do with everybody is I figured out that I can switch my camera here and walk around and kind of provide a verbal tour about the kinds of things you're looking at. I'll try to describe some of our practices as I'm going through. And then I'm happy as well to hold space for some questions at the end and everything, just depending on the time that we have allowed and just hopefully get you all a sense of what it would be like if you were here on the farm. That sounds great. Great, okay, so here I'm gonna flip my camera. There it is, okay. Can everybody see what's happening here? Yeah. So we are four acres. We have about two acres under vegetable production at any given time. And then the other two acres are dedicated to a perennial pasture and orchard and like barnyard area. So the first section of the tour that I'll give you is kind of our field and active vegetable growing production space. Then we'll go visit the livestock and then we'll kind of get a glance at some of that pasture and orchard area. So this field here that you're looking at is one of our spring fields. So there's a number of different crops growing. We've got like some green tot soy here. We've got chard and carrots and uh, pak choy, lots of radishes, some lettuce mix and kales in the distance and a hearty onion field there that we just planted. And one of the things that we really practice are crop rotation and crop diversity. So here on the farm, we grow over 120 different varieties of different fruits and vegetables. And a large part of that is due to the uncertain nature of the climate every year. We never know what's going to do really well in depending on what the weather's like and what the season's like. So by growing a diversity of crops, we're always hedging our bets in this way. Some years, one type of radish will thrive, another won't do so well, whereas that's the kind that did really well last year. So we really like to encourage and learn and we keep really good records about what does well, some of the components that went into that. It also helps a lot with pest management. So by rotating the crops, this time last year, this whole field was our, where our onions were, and we've just since rotated them. The pests find a harder time to find what they love. So in that way, if we had onion thrips or all these different things, and they are in the soil overwintering, when they wake up here in the spring, there's no onions here again, right? Like they kind of skip it. Or same thing, we deal with a relatively new invasive pest called the harlequin bug. And that is so insidious. It will really take down everything. And it also overwinters in the soil. One year we also had the bagrata bug, which is like its tiny cousin. So by making sure that we're never planting things in the same place, we're reducing the pest pressure, as well as ensuring that we're not overdrawing nutrients from the farm fields and that different crops utilize different nutrients in the soil. And in that way, we're able to also keep our nutrient cycle healthy. Now, one thing you'll notice, and I'll walk over here, we just finished prepping these beds and are getting ready to plant summer crops in them, is there is so much mulch everywhere, right? There's so much organic matter on the surface of the soil. And when I was a young farmer, I would have looked at this and been like, gosh, that is just filthy. That is a mess. What is happening? I definitely did not understand the benefits that having this much organic matter can come. So you can see some of this dead looking grass here was actually this beautiful winter rye cover crop that we had. And we're currently practicing this system called no-till. We're in transition on the farm. So we no longer utilize tillage agriculture to grow our food. Tillage, I'm gonna use the hand signal, kind of takes the soil and it strips it and it shreds it and it rips it up and it really kills everything and it goes deep. What we do now is a method of broad forking. So it's like this big giant 
fork that kind of goes into the earth and punctures it and kind of aerates it, but it doesn't shred it. It doesn't invert it. It just kind of aerates it and allows a little more um, flow to go, particularly when we're dealing with our heavy clay soils, that happens. And then all of this organic matter gets to stay and it's incorporated into the soil over the years. It's all this different crop residue that we mow. It helps retain water and moisture in our fields. I actually can really tell over the years now that we've transitioned to no-till and really focused on increasing both our surface cover and in-ground organic matter, just how much more water the soil holds. An unhealthy soil can tend to be really hydrophobic, so you kind of miss out on a lot of that nutrient cycle, a lot of that water capturing with the little rain we get. I think we got a few drops yesterday, right? Like I want as much of that to stay here as possible. And all the microorganisms actually have food sources all year long too that they can consume and eat while not literally ripping everything to shreds every year. It's been quite an amazing transition. So pretty much every field that I'm gonna show you this year or this little tour too, just know it's all no-till and more and more and more we're trying to shift as well to perennial agriculture, which will be fun. So yeah, kind of walking back over here. Now, one of the other things too, is even in our open space here, you'll see as I walk over towards the greenhouse, we've got all of this mulch. So when we get all these big winter or sprig, spring winds, and when we do get our rain events, which are heavier and harder more and more each season, what happens is the farm once upon a time was this big source of dust, this big source of mud, it was a hot mess. And by mulching all of our open exposed areas where we're traversing and everything, we actually reduce a lot on like the simple air pollution for ourselves and for our whole neighborhood, right? And also I really like to do this thing and I'll kind of show you this as we go where I start finding little spaces to fill with perennial plants. So we're also prepping and rebuilding the soil a little bit before I figure that out. So this bed here, this used to just be a barren part of the driveway, but now we've got a bunch of rosemary and lavender and some little tiny baby volunteer cosmos which you may or may not be able to see and different onion chives all sorts of things and what used to just be like i said kind of an unhealthy little chunk of driveway so more and more we're trying to build in habitat like that as well so one of the things we do on the farm as well is we grow all our own plant starts from seed and how we do that is in our greenhouse which i'll walk in right here now and many of these seeds we save ourselves in addition to needing to purchase some of the more rare varieties. I always like having my solid standbys that I love and grow every year while also experimenting with new ones as our climate's changing and everything. Again, just to make sure that we're not missing out on anything that could thrive really well. So here we've got a number of peppers and curcubits, different squash, eggplant, all kinds of things, a ton of different tomatoes, I'll turn off these fans here. I forgot that they would be on. There we go. And then one of the funnest things that I love doing is getting all these really fun herbs. So this year we have a number of rue. We've got Mexican marigold mint, lemon balm, a white medicinal yarrow. We've got like a dragon head balm, which I've never even seen in person before. I don't know what that's gonna look like. I'm stoked. Caraway, Roman chamomile, a bunch of different fever fuse. More and more on the farm too, I'm trying to focus on some of the medicinal properties of plants. So as we integrate some of these really great perennials, we're slowly building out different lines of like different medicinal salves and everything, which I really love. You can see here, just some more fun things. We've got these beautiful marigolds, different basils germinating all kinds of things. And what's great is that even though it looks like we have this big propane heater, all of this is only heated with a little thermostat and these little seed mats. And someday I'd love to put them on solar power. So we're trying not to just pump this whole thing full of propane in order to keep all the plants alive. I call them my space bubbles. Every night we close this up and it's got a thick layer, almost like second layer of plastic that comes over them. And that's what keeps the plants safe at night in addition to their little heat mats. And in the morning we open it up, let it get some air. And in that way, we're able to grow without using so many fossil fuels as well. All right, so as we exit the greenhouse here, we've got this beautiful field of garlic. Now, once upon a time, Chispas used to be known for garlic. I've heard rumors that at one point this farm had over 500 different varieties. 
And unfortunately, in the transition from the previous farmers to myself, we lost, we lost every single variety. I didn't inherit a single head of garlic. So all of this garlic field has been the slow, tireless, multi-year process of bringing that back. Some of it came with me from a farm I was at before, Red Tractor Farm, this like lovely California creamy white. It looks very beautiful. Others have come from different friends. So we have like a Tosh Kent variety here. That's a beautiful red variety. It's a little skinnier and a little taller. We've got some beautiful Moroccan, which came from my friend Jesse at Amio Farms. It's also kind of an early variety looking really good. And fun this year, we've got elephant garlic. You can see how thick those babes are. Boy, I love it. I can't wait. We're doing quite a significant amount of elephant garlic this year, which is technically a leak. Um, but one of the funnest things and one of the things I'm so grateful for and looking forward to continuing into the future is we were lucky enough to get um, to, to meet a seed steward right in my early years when I started at Cheese Bus. And he had about 30 different varieties of garlic that he was needing to find a longer term steward for in a way that could really grow it healthy. So that's what this all this garlic is here. So since I started it, he gave us 32 varieties. And the first year, it was simply enough to fill one bed. It was so few. All the heads were so small. Many of the varieties are extremely rare, at risk of going extinct. Basically, as different seed companies were closing, he was grabbing what he could of some of the rare or less popular varieties in order to keep them alive. So when he gave them to me, it felt like this huge honor. And also, there was a lot of pressure there, right? Like, I am the last grower of some of these different varieties. But what's been wonderful is as we've grown them out and as we've gotten them stronger, we have about seven other farms now that I've been able to partner with. And we're starting like a garlic seed stewardship co-op. So every year as we grow out more and more different varieties and figure out what really thrives, we find a member farm that's willing to take on and assign responsibility for one of these rare varieties. And it becomes one of theirs then. And in that way too, the burden of all of this seed stewardship and saving isn't necessarily just on one farm. You know, that's when we always have this like really unis, unifocus thing, it's like really at risk of being lost. You know, what if something happens? But now with these six farms are stewarding 13 of their own varieties. And I'm kind of stewarding some of the still ones that we're still trying to get healthy, still trying to grow up, get a little stronger. And then every year we reach out to different farmers and they're assigned. And really the promise is, is I'll give them the seed stock for free, all the cloves that we grow. And then they just have to commit to growing it every year. And if they ever decide to stop growing it, they just give me the same amount of seed that they got at that one year and we'll grow it and we'll find a new partner. And in that way too, we're kind of sharing the load as well as we get all these varieties, but it's kind of fun just even walking down a little bit on the beds, you can see just how drastically different some of these ones look from each other as we go. And another thing you'll notice too, is that we have a lot of weeds in the path, right? Everyone's always like, wow, how do you live with all those weeds in the path? And honestly, I love them. Our primary method of handling those is just line trimming. But really what happens is it helps create this mulch you'll see within the path there. I didn't mulch anything on there. There's all of that organic matter. So as we line trim this, we're actually mulching the paths and the temperature. I wish you could feel it when I was walking on the driveway there where it's just exposed it's like a little bit hotter and then as soon as I enter this area the temperature drops so it's also helping with some of that extreme heat it's keeping more of a living mat that's also capturing things and we'll weed in between the bed sure you know but like we don't always have to keep things so clean all the time is something that I've been learning over the years this field here is a field that we're still improving so I had this method in the first few years where I had a ton of compost so this was me and my crew's work this past, um, this past week was getting this corn ready or this field ready to plant different corn and beans. We're doing a number of different dry land crops this year, particularly with the drought situation so severe. Uh, and normally we would only, we would get water twice a month from March through October. This year, we didn't get our first irrigation until last week. It's the only irrigation of the month. And we'll be lucky if we get it once a month through July is what we were informed. So we're really kind of hedging our bets. We found some really strong 90 day corn that's grown in really tough environments. So we're really composting. You can see all this beautiful mulch and everything on here. And we're hoping that if we can get it in soon, it can get a few waters, it'll survive. In addition to that, we're also planting things like tepary beans, which is an indigenous bean. They're incredible. They really can survive on just a few irrigations and provide a really nutrient rich hardy crop. 
So I'm really looking forward to seeing this field here come, you know, September. I really hope it's productive and it'll only have gotten two or three irrigations on it. So then one of the other areas I'll show you, which is really one of the joys and when we're able to have events again, I can't wait to have many of you out here to visit it, is this area. So this area we call the woods. These are just highly manicured elm trees. You wouldn't believe it, right? They're very old. When I got here, I made it my priority to kind of clean this area up. And you wouldn't believe it, but this hasn't been irrigated once this season at all, right? This is all a number of different perennial grasses and flowers. The trees kind of create this really lush, like microclimate here. And it really is just able to thrive with little to no water now. Now we'll see what it looks like here later in the summer. But I am quite pleased with how in combination with everything, it's really greened up. And this is one of the key areas of sustainability that I really enjoy, and that's a social area. So typically, whenever we do have school groups or events or volunteers and things like that, they are able to come to this like lush little oasis and eat their lunch, hang out. We had a small group of high schoolers that were like in their own little COVID bubble come and camp on here. Um, it really just provides this like sweet space for community engagement. And then, I mean, with a view like this, how could you go wrong, right? Like, heck yeah, it's so beautiful out here. So this is another little spring field that we've got here. So we've got more lettuce mix. It's all this pretty purple and red here. We've got different leeks planted, turnips, some baby fennel, some arugula, some radishes, all kinds of things. We just recently planted some potatoes too, which I'm really looking forward to. I can't wait. This little area has both a potato and a leek bed right next to it. I'm calling it my soup rose here. I'm so excited. And then here we were lucky to partner with the NRCS in the last year um, to help build this hoop house. It's actually two hoop houses combined. It's 164 feet. And we don't have too much growing in here. We had a rough start in the greenhouse. Um, so most of our starts died, but we're getting ready to plant it here soon with our summer crops. And one thing that I really love in here are these beautiful peas. Aren't they awesome? Look at that pea flower, it's gorgeous. Also, one of the most exciting things I did an experiment crop out here and it worked are these fava beans. And I love their flowers too. Let's see if I can find, oh yeah, here we go. Check that out. I don't know if you can see that, but there's some beautiful black on there. It's like a landing pad for the bees. So if these are fava beans, rather stout, gorgeous plants that I'm like, well, shoot, I better do like 200 feet of those next year. They're doing great. We also have some other areas. This is the back area of the farm that never got much love. It had a few jujubes. So we've done this thing where we've planted all these bulbs in between everyone. And then also there's a bunch of artichokes. So these artichokes are about three years old now and they go the whole stretch. And then we also did an experiment where I planted some rhubarb and it's not the healthiest rhubarb, but it's not dead either. So fingers crossed it'll grow back. We thought it had died last year. And then about a week ago, we were kind of walking around and we we're like, hey, there it is. It actually survived. How fantastic is that? And then one of the funnest experiments that has worked really well is this perennial bed of flowers and herbs right next to the hoop house. So this gets all of that rainwater drainage that comes off the side whenever we do get rainwater. And here we've got a number of different onion chives. That's a beautiful echinacea plant right there. We've got different sedum, that's what this is. It's like a perennial succulent that grows. We've got all these different bulbs. So there's some gladiolas just popping up. We had a row of daffodils here that have already come and left. And then these have been just like the delight of my life lately. These are like really wild allium flowers. So like, I can't even believe are real and they're doing so well. And there's so many of them, as you can see down the stretch, that it's like, what the heck, this is incredible. So there are some hyacinths, there's a bunch of thyme, rudbeckia, I've got some fever few in this bed. So really I just keep throwing more and more perennials at it. And what's great is that we had such a hard spring. Oh, there's a nice fat little bumblebee there getting in it. Do you see him? 
Nice. Yeah, these flowers are actually very active right now. Look at that little hoverfly. Heck yeah, I love it. Um, and this way too, it's like, even though we had a really hard spring, by focusing on perennials and getting all these herbs and flowers, we've actually still had harvests and they're from all the work that we put in years ago that is now slowly starting to amp up and take off. And then another happy experiment that we had is this asparagus. So this was all started by seed in our greenhouse just a year ago, these really tall plants. And I don't know if you know this, but organic asparagus grounds are quite expensive. So we decided that we would turn this whole bed into a nursery bed to grow our own asparagus crowns. And it was so absurdly uh, like productive and successful. Again, I wasn't quite expecting them to come back and here they are, that we planted more. I don't know if you can see, but that's a little tiny asparagus baby. It's so little, they're so little. This is literally the size that these were last year. That's how they started. It's amazing how vigorous they've been and how well they're doing. So that has just been a blast, let me tell you. The, the more I do with perennials, the more I'm like, this is where it's at, these, these are awesome. And then the fun thing about asparagus, if none of you have seen it growing, it's a little late in the season, but we like to laugh that asparagus grows like it's trying to prank you into thinking that's the way asparagus grows. I don't know if you see, see that single asparagus stalk. Like who would have thought that that is how it actually grows and then it develops into these beautiful fronds. So it winds up looking more like a dill or a fennel or something in the long run, but it really does just grow as that stalk that we wind up harvesting and eating. All right. Another really great and successful component of the farm for myself personally um, has been this perennial pasture. So when I got on to Chispas years ago, they had never really grown in this whole portion of the farm that you're seeing now. And you can see now there's a bunch of really healthy bunch grasses that also just only got water a week ago and there they are. But this whole area of the farm was completely barren once upon a time and had been barren for years. And then through a lot of intention and working with the flood water, I see all this green and all that debris cover there as a huge victory, right? I wonder how much carbon we've been capturing in this field alone over the years. And then all summer, this is where our livestock get to graze. So in that way too, we're kind of bringing up this field that had never been used before, was completely barren. We're like the number of birds and different animals that now reside on this and come and visit annually and stuff is like exponentially increased it's like so cool to see all these like different flocks like eating whatever they can find seeds bugs insects all those kinds of things and then also to know that our livestock get to come on here now what's funny is i've been looking at some of our instagram photos from this time last year when we are getting regular water this by this time last year this was lush and huge and thriving and just like, it looked like, you know, like you're in Ireland or something. It was like unbelievable. So you're definitely seeing a drought perennial pasture at the moment, um, but still a victory, right? The fact that this has only gotten one irrigation all year and we still have all this greenery coming up and all this cover, that is huge, right? So I'll take what I can get this year for sure. All right, so now we're gonna start trekking back towards the animals. They're definitely wondering what the heck I'm doing out here. So I never intended to have a bunch of livestock when I started at Chispas. However, this area that I'm going to show you, that's the barnyard. When we first started irrigating, this area that was the barnyard was this nasty, non-draining, really gross mosquito breeding pit. I can't even call it a pond because it was just so gross. Like nobody wanted to be around it. And as part of our soil remediation strategies, we were trying to figure out, well, what do you do with a nasty non-draining mosquito breeding pit, right? And we were like, well, we could bring livestock on and we're practicing this method of deep bedding, we call it, where as the animals live their lives, you see, we have a hundred laying hens. There's some of them. Hey cuties, come over here, guys. I got some treats for you. So now the animals live their lives. They all come over here. We had a bunch of lambs born this year. That's what all those young ones are. Um, they are pooping and peeing and really, really getting all in there in the wood chips. 
And instead of mucking it out, we don't really ever muck it out. This one I call Joe. I like Joe. Hey, Joe, Joe, how's it going? Um, we just add more wood chips. And so long term, we're hoping that this will be one of the healthiest, most productive fields. And it no longer is this nasty place that nobody wants to be around. But now all these wonderful animals get to live their lives and we get to visit them. This one I call Freckles. She's very nice too. Hi, Freckles. How's it going? And then we integrate the chickens into everything. So many of them are busy laying, but this is kind of their like private backspace where they get some shade and get to hang out. You can hear those chicken egg laying sounds in the background, I'm sure. There's my rooster. I call him pretty boy. He's very, he's a very good boy. And they get to hang out with the goats and the sheep. And kind of they get run of the whole yard here too. Oh, it looks like one of them found an egg. I hate when they do that, but there they are. And then these are new. For a little while we had cows. They weren't mine, but when uh, this winter, the fellow who had them wanted to sell them. So we decided we'd let them sell them. And then we got these cute goats instead. So this one's Lotus. She's a good girl. And then those are her two kids. And then over there is Leche. And these are our milk animals. So we milk them every day. And then we're also doing um, kind of an informal milk share co-op where there's about five other people who come down and they milk in the mornings and they do the morning chores. And in exchange, they get to go home and keep the milk. And from these two humble goats, we get a gallon of milk a day, which is bananas. It's a lot of milk. And then the kids are so cute. We have two little does, which we'll get to say to us, and then two little weathers. And we're actually thinking about training the weathers to be pet goats. So they might go on long walks with us in the future, or they'll be trained and we're hoping to maybe partner with some um, like animal therapy groups because they're very friendly. They love everybody. This one we call Donkey. She's very cute. And then as we go back, here's our orchard. So here we've got maybe 20 to 30 different varieties of trees, plums, cherries, apricots, nectarines, apples, uh, all kinds of things. And then these are grapes. So we've got two really beautiful rows of grapes. And then some figs are in the middle. I hope they made it this year, we'll see. But really here's, here's the beautiful shot. So this whole orchard too is mostly on flood. We did install some uh, drip irrigation to keep the trees alive, particularly in this drought year. There's some wild chickens going through. But here too, we have a number of different perennial wildflowers and medicinal herbs. So we're kind of taking advantage of this microclimate here as well. And it's really great. So you can see we've got irises and fennel and comfrey and all these different herbs and everything. I really love the orchard. Another space like I was talking about, this whole area used to be just full of trash and piled up storage areas, but now we've kind of turned it into our little fairy garden. So you can see here, we, one of my coworkers really got into it. She got these cute little figures for the fairies. But really what we've got here too is all this mint and bee balm and lovage and garlic chives. This is a big old mama apricot tree that's protecting everything. We've got lemon balm and fennel and a whole bunch of sage. And again, in this way too, we're able to turn these like really underutilized edge areas of the farm into something beautiful and productive. And for me too, I think there's this concept of you can feel the spirit of the land and when it's in a place and with a place, and you can also feel when it's left. And I feel like when I got here, it was not as vital and it really had kind of lost some of that. And it's been beautiful over the years building a relationship with the space to see it coming back and to be able to find a little magical spot like our fairy garden. My ancestors are Irish, so really the fairies are the ones that help us, right? And then my coworker, Raina, she's from Zuni. She's very much connected with the different spirits of the land. It's been beautiful to see how our cultures intertwine in this way. But it's delightful too, to see how unexpected spaces like this kind of pop up, these magical spaces as you slowly steward the land over the years that really just are so generative and contribute to all of these other things. And I think I'm running out on time but I'll show you some of the geese who I find hilarious. My neighbor brought some geese by the other day. They're currently residing in the pasture. They're pretty funny. Hey guys. Chatty. Aren't they hilarious? 
<laughs> I love them. Anyway, that's our little tour of Cheese Bus. And if we have time, I'd be happy to answer some questions. And if not, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Casey. You just had me really excited for when we can do some in-person farm tours in the future. I'd love to Heck yeah, get I'd love that. experience it. Yeah, we'll have to keep an eye on that. Uh, we are just about at uh, a time for a scheduled five minute break, but if anybody does have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. If, uh, if you see any, Casey, that you can respond to there, go ahead, that'd be great. Uh, and otherwise, I posted uh, the Cheese Bus Farm handle for Facebook and Instagram, so you can connect with Cheese Bus Farm that way as well. Thank you so much, Casey. That was that was delightful. That was so awesome. I got to come meet the goats. All right. Thanks. I have one more thing to announce. So we are mm -hmm. having a COVID safe outdoor farm plant sale on Saturday, May 1st from 1030 oh. to 4 here on the farm. You can check out our website. Um, it, the event is on our Facebook page. And yeah, just feel free to reach out or see what's going on. That's another like, come see the plant sale and get to explore the farm for a bit. Masks required. Um, and yes, I see a question. Any volunteer work available at the farm? We love volunteers. So go ahead and send that email list. I'll put the website and the email and the thing. And we love having folks engaged. I really like to be community focused. So thank you so much for everybody's time. Thank you. Cool. That sounds Thanks, great. Casey.